Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the uh, Vienna Wiesenthal Lecture. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker. This evening, uh, Jeffrey Alexander gained his PhD, uh, his BA from Harvard in 1969, and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 1978. He worked at the same university from 1974 until joining Yale in 2001, I'm correct, <laughs> uh, where he became a professor of sociology and co-director of the Center for Cultural Sociology in 2008. He's the, the author uh, of The Meaning of Social Life, a Cultural Sociology, uh, published in 2003, co-author of the book Cultural Trauma and Collective Identity, published in 2004, and the Cambridge Compa Companion to Durkheim, 2005, and so on. He's also co-editor uh, of Social Performance, Symbolic Action, Cultural Pragmatics and Ritual, 2006. For this lecture, uh, this book is very important, the Remembering uh, the Holocaust, a debate, uh, for me it was a must, so I hope we will, we will also have a very fruitful and uh, interesting debate uh, after the presentation this evening. And as you know, the title of the lecture is Culture, Trauma, Morality and Solidarity, the Social Construction of Holocaust and Other Mass Murders. So Jeff, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, I'm happy to be here. Um, cultural trauma occurs when members of a collectivity feel they've been subjected to an horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their collective consciousness, making their memories, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. As I've developed this sociological approach with colleagues and students, cultural trauma is, first of all, a theoretical concept. It suggests empirical causal relationships between previously unrelated events, structures, perceptions, actions. But the scientific concept also illuminates a significant domain of moral responsibility and political action. By constructing cultural traumas, social groups, national societies, and sometimes even civilizations not only cognitively identify the existence and source of human suffering, but may also take on board moral responsibility for it. Insofar as groups identify the cause of trauma in a manner that implies their own moral responsibility, members of collectivities define their solidary relationships in ways that allow them, perhaps even compel them, to share the sufferings of other people. Is the suffering of others our own? In thinking that it might be, societies can expand the circle of the we. When the circle of the we expands, extraordinary repairs in the institutional legal networks of society can be made. Some of the most important social developments in the post-war world have been produced by this kind of trauma process. Because social actors have newly identified themselves as causal agents, social solidarity has expanded, moral universalism and social criticism have broadened, and fundamental institutional and legal changes have been made. Most extraordinary of all these developments has been the gradual halting, still incomplete and contested, but eventually intensely powerful identification of Christian peoples in the West with the millions of Jewish persons murdered by the Nazis during the Second World War. For millennia, Christian civilization had polluted Jews as nefarious and subhuman, excluding them from civil society, 
punishing them economically, persecuting them culturally and politically, and sometimes doing far worse. When the Enlightenment unlocked the gates of European ghettos in the early 19th century, the oozing anti-Semitic wound that infected modernity seemed on the mend. But the backlash against Jewish incorporation was fierce. Pogroms in the East, the Dreyfus scandal in Republican France, new quotas and old restrictions in the United States, rising anti-Jewish feelings and politics in Central Europe. The Nazi monster rose out of this primordial slime. Yet while the Nazis' anti-Semitic strategy was more ambitious and extreme than had ever before been contemplated, their anti-Semitic feeling was not. Its anti-democratic totalitarian state allowed Nazis to put into effect their permanent solution to the Jewish question, and it was the military defeat of that state that prevented the permanent solutions ultimate success. Yet, while the Nazi state was demolished, broad anti-Semitic feelings remained and not in post-war Germany alone. In subsequent decades, however, the widespread Jewish hatred that had legitimated the Nazis' mass murder, allowing a blind eye to be turned to it, was sharply attenuated. The pervasive network of anti-Semitic legal and institutional restrictions that existed throughout the West was, as a result, eventually destroyed. At the source of this Weltgeschichte reversal was trauma work. Christian peoples who had nothing to do with the Holocaust, Americans, British, French, Scandinavians, and Austrians among them, came eventually to feel indirectly responsible for it. In doing so, they distanced themselves from anti-Semitic feelings and practices in which they had themselves been deeply implicated. Citizens of Christian nations had restricted and persecuted Jews in their own nations. They had stood by as Germany instituted the Nuremberg Laws in 1933 and initiated Kristallnacht in 1938. After learning of the death camps in 1943, Allied war leaders had refused to divert the bombing campaign to stop the quickly gathering slaughter for even one day. Certainly it was fear of pervasive domestic anti-Semitism that motivated the leader's decision. Of course, in spring 1945, millions of Western citizens shrank in horror from the news photos from Buchenwald. But the American GIs who took over the camps often showed more sympathy for the German officials under their arrest than for the angry, emaciated, and foreign-seeming Jews whom they had liberated. And in the years immediately after the war, it was Nazi barbarians, not the German people, and least of all Western anti-Semitic civilization, more broadly considered, who were held responsible for the Holocaust. So in the immediate wake of the trauma, the circle of the we was drawn very narrowly indeed. As Bernhard Gießen has shown, it took three generations for the German people, and even then, only those inside the democratically reconstructed Western German nation, to take on board a broader sense of responsibility, to sharply separate themselves from the self-justifying exculpations of former participants, and the hate-filled collective identity of earlier versions of the German nation. In one of the more radical cultural transformations of modern history, uh, Germany eventually became a loyal friend of Israel, the land that, not, that Jewish Nazi victims had occupied to escape. The former Nazi nation now has the largest Jewish population in Central Europe, 
German Jews continually reporting high levels of acceptance and safety in contemporary Germany. In post-communist Poland, the longing for reconciliation is also palpable, at least in the cosmopolitan centers. Philo-Semitism is pronounced, klezmer music revived, festivals celebrating lost memories of Jewish culture organized annually. In the US, Jewish writers, scientists, doctors, and businessmen have been incorporated into the elite core groups that had rejected them for centuries before. This transformation of the cultural identity and social status of one of the world's most fiercely denigrated groups was the result of a trauma process. The Holocaust came to occupy a central position in the collective identity of Western societies. And in the course of this deepening centrality, the understanding of the Jewish mass murder subtly but decisively changed. One vital thread of this trauma process transformed the image of the victim. Rather than seeing the Nazis' Jewish victims as a depersonalized mass and mess, popular culture began to personalize and differentiate them. Portraying Jews as recognizably human beings allowed non-Jews for the first time to experience deep emotionally, emotional identification with the six million Jews who were Nazi victims. A powerful channel for this new form of cultural expression was the memoir. In the 1950s, there unfolded a series of dramatizations of the suffering and courage of the Dutch every girl, Anne Frank, whose diary eventually became required reading for tens of millions of elementary school children. In the decade after Eli, Elie Wiesel's Night also achieved massive popularity, deeply penetrating the consciousness and conscience of Christian and secular citizens in the West. Another popular cultural, culture genre driving this line of trauma work was televised melodramas. In 1978, 100 million Americans viewed the Holocaust miniseries, and so did record-breaking audiences in Germany. In fact, it was in the wake of this miniseries that the German Reichstag removed the statute of limitations on Nazi agents, whose actions were now described, note the generalization, as crimes against humanity not as crimes against Jews. Such dramaturgical personalization of Jewish victims began to transform the Holocaust from an historical event into a deeply moving trauma drama, one that increasingly engaged non-Jewish audiences in pathetic experiences of tragedy and catharsis. This cultural transformation was pushed further by a new understanding of Holocaust perpetrators. Personalization had so altered the identity of the trauma's victim as to allow them, the victim, to become a dramatic protagonist. Now the other central figure in the Holocaust narrative, the Nazi antagonist, was also subtly changed perpetrator was removed from its historically specific particularity. Its status transformed into a more archetypically evil role that would become a stand-in for all humankind. The critical event initiating this reconstruction of perpetrator was the 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem. As orchestrated by Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, Eichmann's capture and trial was intended to reconnect the new nation's citizens to the persons and places of the original crime, to Germany, the Nazis, and the victimized Jews. In Ben-Gurion's words, to quote, to quote, the dimensions of the tragedy which our people experienced. <laughs> 
By its conclusion, however, the Eichmann trial had actually initiated something very different, which was a massive universalization of Nazi evil. The removal of the Holocaust from particulars of time, place, and person was crystallized by Hannah Arendt's insistence on the banality of evil. This framing of Nazi guilt became or reframing, really, of Nazi guilt became highly influential, even as it was bitterly disputed. As a banally evil person, Eichmann could be every man. The antagonist in the Holocaust trauma drama began to seem not so much larger-than-life monsters as normal human beings who were not so different from anybody else. Perhaps they were simply, as Nietzsche put it, human, all too human. This newly emerging mentality was eloquently expressed by the British-American poet W.H. Auden in his 1965 poem, The Cave of Making. More than ever, life out there is goodly, miraculous, lovable, but we shan't, not since Stalin and Hitler, trust ourselves ever again we know that subjectively all is possible. It's not accidental that he wrote that in 65 when this process I'm describing was well underway. Other cultural developments also widened the circle of perpetrators. Most spectacularly, there was Yale psychologist Stanley Milgram's experiment demonstrating that ordinary, well-educated adult men would, quote, just follow orders from imperious authorities, even to the point of gravely endangering the lives of innocent people whose fates they imagined were under their control. Raising profoundly troubling questions, Milgram's findings generalized the capacity for radical evil, moving it from Nazi deviance to everyday Americanism, and perhaps to humanity as such. Decades later, Christopher Browning provided historical documentation for this broadening in his 1992 book, Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland. When Daniel Goldhagen challenged Browning in his book, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans and the Holocaust in 1996, he insisted on the uniqueness of German anti-Semitism, and Browning revealingly responded by referencing Milgram, averring that the character of perpetrators should not be particularized but universalized. Quote, what allowed the Nazis to mobilize and harness the rest of society to the mass murder of European Jewry? Browning writes, or asks, here, I think, we historians need to turn to the insights of social psychology. We must ask, what really is a human being? We must give up the comforting and distancing notions that the perpetrators of the Holocaust were fundamentally a different kind of people. As the Holocaust trauma drama broadened the cultural identification of and with perpetrator and victim, the U.S. government began losing political control over the telling of the Holocaust story. When the Allied forces had defeated Nazi Germany in 1945, they took over control of the representation process, thus assuring that the Jewish mass murder would now be presented openly and also, of course, in an anti-Nazi manner. In their telling, the former allies, America most powerfully, but Britain and France as well, presented themselves as moral protagonists, as pure-hearted, heroic carriers of the good. Two decades later, however, during the political wars of the 1960s, Western democracies were compelled to concede this dominant narrative position this time around, as compared with 1945, control over 
the means of symbolic production changed hands for cultural reasons, not by force of arms. In the critical years between the mid-1960s and the end of the 70s, the US experienced a sharp decline in its political, military, and moral prestige. Domestic and international opposition to America's prosecution of the Vietnam War transformed the nation into a symbol for many, not of salvationary good, but apocalyptic, anti-democratic evil. This transvaluation was intensified by revolutionary student and black power movements inside the US and by anti-capitalist guerrilla movements outside. The US now became identified in some influential quarters with terms that had once been reserved exclusively for the Holocaust's Nazi perpetrators. According to the post-war Victor narrative, only the Allies' World War II enemies could be represented as evil. But when America became America, spelled I-K-A, America, which was a very popular way of spelling America in the radical movements of the 60s, napalm bombs, were, which had been, were being dropped in Vietnam, were analogized with gas pellets and flaming Vietnamese jungles with the killing chambers of Auschwitz. The American army had been hailed as the liberator of the death camps and vowing not to repeat the pre-war Nazi appeasement claimed in the 1960s to be prosecuting a righteous war against another totalitarian system this one communist. But for many Western intellectuals and a wide swath of the Western educated public, the US Army was now framed as itself perpetrating genocide against hel helpless victims in Vietnam. Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre established a war crimes tribunal that applied the logic of Nuremberg to the United States. Incidents of civilian killings, like the My Lai Massacre of 1968, were represented not as anomalies, but as an American policy of mass murder. The analogy between Nazi and American leaders was also made in more scholarly ways. For example, revisionist historians revealed that American and British leaders had known about the death camps by 1943 and had refused to bomb them, as I mentioned earlier. There also emerged new historical interest in the fire bombings of German and Japanese cities and in America's atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Eventually, this broadening of the figure of perpetrator expanded to include other allied powers in the Second World War, and those who had remained avowedly neutral as well. Charles de Gaulle had woven a narrative that purified the French nation as first the victim and later the courageous opponent of both Nazi domination and the foreign, quote, collaborationists of Vichy. By the late 70s and 80s, however, young French historians were challenging this account, seriously polluting the pre-war French government of the Third Republic, and by implication its post-war successors, these revisionists documented a pattern of massive French collaboration with the Nazis' anti-Jewish activities. As the symbolic power of the Holocaust trauma drama intensified, it was only a matter of time until other nations who had been defeated and occupied, and even those that had remained neutral, were also forced to relinquish symbolic control over how their own stories were told. Austria, for example, had long depicted itself as the helpless first victim of Nazi aggression. When Kurt Waldheim ascended to the position of UN Secretary General, however, his hidden association with the Hitler regime was, wide, was widely revealed, and the symbolic status of the Austrian nation, which split, let's say, 50-50, but half in support, 
suffered a kind of crisis. Switzerland became subject to a similar inversion of symbolic fortune. The tiny republic, of course, had long prided itself on its history of Canton democracy and the benevolent neutrality of its Red Cross. In the 1990s, however, journalists and historians documented the wartime Swiss government laundering Nazi gold. In return for the valuable minerals plundered from the bodies of condemned and murdered Jews, Swiss bankers gave Nazi authorities unmarked currency that could be used to finance Holocaust and war. These processes of political deconstruction and symbolic inversion universalized the Holocaust. They allowed the so-called lessons of the Holocaust, often referred to as post-Holocaust morality, to be applied in less nationally specific and particularistic ways. The Holocaust symbol came to stand for the systematic employment of mass violence against members of any stigmatized collectivity, whether defined in a primordial or ideological way at anywhere and any time. As a symbol of radical evil, Holocaust became engorged, overflowing with badness now dramatized as a signal tragedy of modern times, this engorged evil became a drama that compelled eternal return in Nietzsche's sense. As with the Greeks and their tragedies, the immersion of Western citizens in the Holocaust drama provided catharsis, moral clarification, and sometimes even grace. The Holocaust legend was told and retold, dramatized, filmed, novelized in hundreds and eventually thousands of aesthetically compelling forms in response not only to emotional need but moral ambition. Its characters, its plot, and its pitiable denouement allowed a heightened sensitivity to modern social evil. The trauma drama's message reflected a modernized, more reflexive version of Greek tragedies. Evil is inside all of us and in every society. If we ourselves have the capacity to be victims and perpetrators, then none of us can legitimately distance ourselves from the suffering of victims or the responsibilities of perpetrators. This cathartic experience and its moral lessons can allow us to change so that we can prevent genocides from ever happening again. The ability to script, cast, and produce a trauma drama about mass murder spread to other nations, to other marginalized and oppressed groups, even to such contemporary enemies of the Jewish-Israeli people as the Palestinians. Holocaust became a bridging metaphor de deployed by the powerless who cast themselves in the role of suffering victim and their opponents in the role of perpetrators. The trauma drama of the Holocaust, the aesthetic moral resources it offered for denunciations of ethnic, racial, and ideological suffering, powered a series of other world his historical transformations in the second half of the 20th century. For example, the struggle against Western imperialism came to be experienced through the prism of the Holocaust drama. Imperialism had once been viewed as a civilizing gift. In the shadow of the Holocaust and its corrosive critique of modernity's pretensions, Western imperialism became reconceived as genocide as objectification and othering, as the cultural and physical destruction of stigmatized civilizations and peoples who were non-white, non-Christian, non-Western. Africans, Algerians, Vietnamese, Indians, Chinese, these civilizations were constructed in the West as helpless victims. And French and British armies and administrators as heinous perpetrators. 
In the post-Holocaust era, influential Western audiences came to understand imperialism according to the logic of that overarching trauma drama of the Holocaust. Seeing colonial governments as perpetrators of genocide and those colonized as abject victims, citizens not only extended sympathy and material support to anti-imperialist movements, whether violent or not, but struggled to purge their own governments of moral pollution by stopping colonial war. This moral inversion and narrative revision helped liberate non-Western nations from the imperialist yoke, removing centuries of Western domination over Eastern and Southern regions of the globe. In doing so, the trauma process radically reshaped the post-war global landscape, creating new legalities and sovereignties, laying down infrastructural tracks for economic globalization. The post-Holocaust story of liberation also made it more difficult, paradoxically, to identify post-colonial domestic repression and new patterns of ethnic and regional war in post-colonial states. Other extraordinarily significant social transformations also unfolded inside the post-Holocaust frame. Consider, for example, the African-American civil rights movement. Black leaders saw how, in the wake of the Holocaust, attacks on anti-Semitic feelings and institutions were beginning to strike strong chords of sympathy and identification among America's white Christian core groups. African Americans projected themselves into the generalized role of earlier Jewish victims, engaging in dramatic performances that generated traumatic violence against themselves as innocent and peaceful demonstrators, the civil rights movement depicted white Southern officials as Gestapo-like, out of control, made in American Nazis, motivated by radical racial hatred. The contemporaneous recovery of slave narratives about what came to be called the middle passage of captured victims from Africa to the New World functioned as analogy with the cattle cars that transported captured Jews to death camps, reinforcing the equation of America's racial caste system with Nazi genocide. Northern white Americans increasingly identified with the black stigmatized victims of Jim Crow racism in the South, withdrawing from the white Southern perpetrators a century of sentimental support. What flowed from this racial trauma drama were, were radical legal and institutional repairs in the social structure of the United States. A similar story about analogical implotment and institutional change can be told about the struggles of indigenous peoples in the Western Hemisphere. From the 1960s onward, there emerged a growing awareness that the first imperial exercises were not against developed civilizations, but against peoples who were there before them. It was not, however, empirical evidence of an objective reality that put the decimation of the first occupants of the Americas on the map of the Western imagination. In 1962, in The Savage Mind, Claude Lévi-Strauss asserted that the most dramatic genocide of all and the most complete was the an annihilation of Earth's first human residents. Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors destroyed native cultures and institutions throughout North and South America, unleashing processes of destruction that eventually resulted in the physical death of most of their peoples as well. Whether identified as Indians, Native Americans, Aborigines, or First Peoples, in the post-Holocaust world, the populations who faced European and later American and Australian expansion have been categorized as victims, their opponents as perpetrators, and the crime as genocide. 
Only in the decades after World War II did the victims of this slow-moving mass destruction become humanized in a manner that could elicit cultural identification and empathy. Their styles of dress, their pierced and tattooed bodies, their painting, sculptures, music, and dance have recently entered in, into the core of the contemporary modern imagination. Their struggles for compensation have generated powerful political support and significant institutional transformations have sometimes been made. The qualifier sometimes provides a segue for me to move now to the darker other side of cultural trauma, which I want to elaborate in the concluding section of this lecture, although I won't have time to fully explore it. As we know all too well, social groups often refuse to recognize the suffering of others. And even when they do recognize it, they frequently place the causal responsibility for inflicting that suffering on events and actors other than themselves. What follows from such refusals is a failure to identify and empathize opting out of the process of trauma creation in this manner prevents the possibility of achieving a moral stance. It restricts solidarity, leaving others to suffer alone. Laws are not changed and institutions are not repaired. Strains that triggered earlier traumas are left in place, a situation that may allow the earlier traumatic events to happen again. Let's continue with the post-war trauma process that centers on first peoples. Frontier societies justified and often ennobled their dominating expansion, narrating it as evolutionary progress, evoking civilizational stories about religious salvation and the secular cultivation of virgin land. Four decades ago, chastened by the increasingly powerful legend of the Holocaust, Western core groups did begin to displace the more racialized strands of their founding narratives, weaving new origin myths in movies, television, songs, novels, and paintings that acknowledge the suffering of original peoples. I've talked about that. For example, Australian leaders apologized and offered reparation, reparations to radically marginalized aborigines. And that nation's intellectuals and cultural entrepreneurs transformed aboriginal totemic drawings, once thought worthless, into highly valuable pieces of art. American political and cultural leaders made similar gestures to decimated Native American remnants, and legal challenges produced restoration of stolen lands that had been guaranteed by old treaties. In Canada, the Anglican Church asked the country's first peoples to forgive it for having created boarding schools dedicated to religious conversion, ruthless discipline, and forced assimilation. In recent decades, however, these broad efforts at cultural revision have attenuated and in inst institutional repairs have slowed. The Ottawa government has turned over to native tribes effective control over large swatches of that nation's land, but these are largely outside the great population centers and remain frozen tundra for most of the year. The American government has restored significant sovereignty to tribal reservations, but the new control, unevenly distributed, has been deployed to build gambling casinos for white Americans, allowing only a small minority of the continent's surviving original settlers to thrive. When Australia's conservative John Howard came to power 18 years ago, he publicly retracted the previous Labour government's apology to Aborigines, advising them to assimilate and get rich. It's impossible to imagine the Christian peoples of the West displaying such ambivalence about the Holocaust, much less contemporary Germans. Indeed, denying the Holocaust is a crime in most European states. 
The same ambivalence and polarization has marred Western efforts to deal with their imperial histories. Since Britain's Tories returned to power four years ago, they have ordered that textbooks be revised so that the civilizing contributions of empire can be highlighted once again. When Prime Minister David Cameron visited India last year, he spoke of the astonishing opportunities provided by its contemporary capitalist markets, but said nothing about the British cotton industry having bankrupted India's weaving enterprises two centuries before. The very suggestion that the Anglo-British should feel shame for their ferocious destruction of the Irish social structure four centuries ago, much less offer apology and reparation, would be heatedly rejected in the United Kingdom of today. The French continue to offer the baccalaureate to les secondaires in their former colonies many of which provide romantic escapes from serious civilization for the wealthy French bourgeoisie. French school textbooks only timidly confront the bloody wars of terror that their nation conducted against Algeria and Vietnam. The Soviet Union lost its empire barely a generation ago, but the leaders and masses of its Russian remnant mostly feel deprived, not guilty. Their sympathy and solidarity is reserved not for the local cultures and the people they dominated and undermined, but for their ethnic Russian uh, confrères left behind when the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. The effects of such a restricted trauma process are now being played out before our very eyes as Russia reoccupies Crimea and threatens Ukraine. In other words, to me, this is a result of a very restricted and narrow trauma process. And what about Russia's victorious Cold War rival, the United States? While revisionist history continues to thrive and tragic narratives about Vietnam persist, neo-imperialist historians have become celebrities for urging Americans not to relinquish their neo-colonial yoke. And overreaching military efforts to make the world safe for democracy have almost bankrupted the US. Meanwhile, most Americans, intellectuals, and everyday folks alike seem genuinely unable to recognize that their nation often does behave in a bullying and hegemonic way. Perhaps the most consequential short circuiting of an imperial trauma process has unfolded on the other side of the world in the Far East. Japanese officials have steadfastly refused to acknowledge the brutal decades-long occupation of China and Korea that preceded their nation's 1945 defeat. If the very existence of traumatic occupation is denied, the suffering of its victims can hardly be contemplated, let alone become the object of empathy. The status of perpetrator is completely rejected, and solidarity remains highly restricted. While Japan's Socialist Party and its powerful teachers' union did persistently challenge such chauvinistic denials, the deeply damaging fact of it has remained government policy. What about the tens of thousands, possibly as many as 200,000 Korean comfort women the young women enslaved as prostitutes by the Imperial Japanese Army. Last week, the Chief Cabinet Secretary of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's conservative government announced that Japan would re-examine its landmark apology that it had offered 20 years ago to the Korean victims. This threat to rescind the apology, according to the New York Times, quote, would most likely draw an explosive reaction from South Korea where the women are seen as an emotionally potent symbol of their nation's brutal early 20th century colonization by Japan. For many Koreans, the push by Japanese rightists, this push by Japanese rightists is seen as, as proof of a lack of remorse over the treatment of wartime brother workers and other victims of Japanese colonization. Um, South Korea's President Park uh, 
has refused even to meet with Prime Minister Abe until Japan shows more contrition. Again, the real effects of a uh, restricted trauma process. What about the Nanjing massacre, where Japanese soldiers hacked and shot to death over the course of just six weeks, one to 200,000 Chinese, beginning in December 1938? The Yasukuni Shrine in Tokyo, which Prime Minister Abe recently resumed visiting, depicts the Chinese as aggressors in Nanjing, and Japan as reluctantly responding on the grounds of self-defense, suggesting a war between equal parties rather than a mass murder. The narrative display in Exhibition Hall 10 claims, quote, the Chinese were soundly defeated and that inside the city, the residents were once again able to live their lives in peace. In other words, in this, the main veterans memorial hall in Tokyo, there's no mention made of the hundreds of thousands of people who were murdered by the Japanese. Such a block trauma process allows Japan to refuse its earlier perpetrator role. Its East Asian co-prosperity sphere is framed not as imperial expansion, but as an effort to confront American hegemony. Its war against America, like its military action in Nanjing, is framed as national self-defense. This restricted construction of trauma suggests that it is wartime Japan, not those it dominated and murdered, that deserves the victim role. After all, Japanese cities were firebombed and Hiroshima and Nagasaki experienced nuclear holocaust. Once again, how trauma work unfolds has real institutional effects. With the cultural pathways for experiencing wider solidarity blocked, contemporary Japan cannot reach out to Korea or to China. China's economic fortunes are intertwined with Japan, but the Chinese are building up their naval forces against Japan and declaring disputed islands their own. Prime Minister Abe recently compared Chinese military activity to the German naval buildup preceding World War I. Even as he works to reshape Japan's military profile and to replace its peace constitution with one that allows militarization. This model of abrogated trauma applies also to mass murders committed by totalitarian communist states. Mao's People's Republic and Stalin's USSR instigated programs that directly and indirectly destroyed tens of millions of their own citizens. During the Great Famine that followed Mao's Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s, millions perished in silence, with the government blocking efforts at providing relief. In the decade following, the Cultural Revolution created many millions more deaths Decades have passed and the revolutionary Maoist regime has disappeared, but in contemporary China it remains impossible publicly to discuss, let alone to mourn, these traumatic events. The political party that perpetrated the horrors will not dispense with its revolutionary narrative and continues to control the means of symbolic production. How can the rule of law let alone democracy, be institutionalized in a society whose government refuses to accept moral responsibility in this way. The Russian case seems different on its face. There has been radical regime change, but the effect on trauma process has been less a matter of kind than degree. The nationalist upsurge in post-Yeltsin Russia Vladimir Putin's insistence that Russians take pride in their greatness again makes it extraordinarily difficult to revisit the hundreds of thousands imprisoned and killed in the gulag, the millions who starved during the Ukrainian famine, and the numberless victims of Stalin's other massive crimes. <laughs>
The wartime leader, Stalin, continues to be configured as a leading protagonist in Russia's modernization narrative, and even the memory records of his millions of victims are hard to find. Memorial, the Moscow-based human rights organization dedicated to preserving artifacts and memories about the Gulag, is being hounded by the Putin government along with other Russian NGOs. Material forces are deeply implicated in social suffering and the strategic calculations and practical considerations that trigger traumatic events require significant social organization. There's no doubt. Organizational, material, and structural forces has often been front and center of Holocaust studies. For example, in Sigmund Bauman's The Holocaust and Modernity. I've been concerned here, however, to trace the manner in which such causes and effects are crucially mediated by symbolic representations of social suffering with understanding how a socio-cultural process channels the emotional effects of suffering and to what effect. These discursive and emotional forces I have shown transform the worlds of morality, but also materiality and organization. Intellectuals, artists, politicians, and social movement leaders create narratives about social suffering not only during, but also after the fact, creating new ideal interests, trauma narratives can trigger significant repairs in the civil fabric. They can also instigate new rounds of social suffering in turn. The cultural construction of collective trauma is fueled by individual experiences of pain and suffering, but it is the threat to the collective rather than individual identity that identifies the suffering at stake. Individual suffering is of extraordinary human, moral, and intellectual import. In itself, however, it is a matter for ethics, psychology, and history. My concern is with traumas that become collective, with how they can be conceived as wounds to a shared social identity. This, I've suggested, is a matter of intense cultural work. Suffering collectivities, whether dyads, groups, societies, or civilizations, don't exist only as material networks. They must be imagined into being. The pivotal question becomes not who did this to me, but what group, group did this to us. Intellectuals, political leaders, and symbol creators of all kinds make competing claims. They identify protagonists and antagonists and weave them into narratives proposed to audiences of third parties. Individual victims react to traumatic injury with repression and denial, gaining relief when these psychological defenses are overcome, bringing pain into consciousness so they are able to mourn. For collectivities, however, it's, it's very different. Rather than denial, repression, and working through, it is a matter of symbolic construction and framing, of creating stories and characters, and moving along from there. A we is constructed via narration and coding, and it is this collective identity that experiences and confronts danger. Millions of individuals may have lost their lives, and many more might have experienced grievous pain. Even then, however, the construction of a shared cultural trauma is not automatically guaranteed. The lives lost and pains experienced are individual facts. Shared trauma depends on collective processes of cultural interpretation. Lost wars, economic depressions, mass murders can be understood according to drastically varying accounts that imply sharply antithetical social prescriptions. If traumas can be reimagined and represented, collective identity will shift. There will be a searching re remembering of the collective past. Solidarity can be expanded and much-needed civil repairs can be made. 
Only such a fully enunciated trauma process can prevent these same terrors from ever happening again. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very impressive presentation. So now the floor is open for questions and comments. Slavomir. Uh, thank you, Professor Alexander. I have uh, two or three questions, if I may. Uh, the first is about um, logic, a logic of a trauma process. Is there anything like an internal logic in the trauma process, or trauma process is depending on contingent factors like historical events, particular contexts? From your uh, today's presentation, I reckon that it is rather um, a contingent, and that there is no lodging within the social construction of trauma that can convince us that this process will lead towards a broader solidarity. It actually could go both ways, towards solidarity or to the opposite. It depends on contingent circumstances. But I'm not sure. The question is whether you agree with that interpretation or maybe there is some sort of theoretical logic in the trauma uh, process. My second question is about identity. Uh, transformations, rethinking of identity, new, new symbolic uh, ways in which we express our especially collective identities. These processes are, are traumatic themselves. Uh, or traumatizing. Uh, they uh, mean sort of a change, sometimes very radical change of self-description, and this creates anxiety, an anxiety that is often counteracted by defensive mechanisms. Therefore, for instance, people who experience that kind of uh, traumatic crisis of identity have a tendency to reject the others or to reject the suffering of the others. They don't tend to identify with the suffering of the others. And I, I wonder in which way this mechanism can um, uh, be included in the, <coughs> uh, in the conception that you uh, present. And my final question is about the Holocaust discourse itself. Um, I think that uh, it is a bit more complicated issue because the way and the Holocaust discourse has been established in, in Europe um, in some circumstances could and actually have led to, towards exclusion of some uh, groups. I'm working personally on Roma and their claims to be recognized as the victims of the Holocaust and I know how difficult it was for them to get recognition and, and this process is I guess not uh, really accomplished in some theoretical uh, and historical books, we still can find this uh, hierarchy of uh, victims, according to which Roma were not the real victims of the Holocaust, but kind of secondary ones. I think that uh, the, in the work of Dan Stone or uh, Eva Hoffman, we can find a certain warning that the way we think the Holocaust could sometimes petrify a certain perception of history which leads towards the exclusion of the, those categories of victims which are not officially recognized. Thank you. Yeah, those are interesting points. I mean, the third question is the, related to the first question in the sense that um, I would say that there is a structure of a trauma process which I, a, 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 an identifiable series of sociological things uh, has to happen or does happen time after time, the same things in response to possible traumatic events. Uh, there's a construction of a perpetrator, there's a construction of a victim, there's an argument about what happened, and there's an argument about what can be, what has to be done in response to what happened and to the narrative of perpetrator and victim. This is, um, this happens immediately and then it is open to reconstruction 
as any human sociological process is. So in my work and the work of people I've co-authored or uh, worked alongside of, we have produced this theory or model of a trauma process, so there is a structure, yes, but any sociological structure, it does, it has to be, it, it goes into society in a thoroughly contingent way, so there's no sense of what the outcome of any process will be. Um, so you develop concepts, you say there is a, a structure of a trauma process, and I think that's very helpful, but how that unfolds is open-ended. Humans have free will, there's agency, there's historical contingency, and that's what people in social life deal with. So, um, so that's my answer to your question. And of course, the second, let's say, the last third of my talk was to show that one trauma process, uh, the Holocaust, was fairly well developed and fully explored in the case of the Jews, but that it was not, it was blocked in regard to many other uh, victims. Um, and that's where I would respond to what you said about the, the Roma people. Yes, a, a trauma process, I, sh I took the trauma process with uh, Jews as fairly amplified and full, although very halting for a long time, um, and showed it was restricted with a number of other groups, but the same logic of restriction certainly applies to the non-Jewish victims of the Holocaust. For example, homosexuals, uh, disabled people, Roma, and of course to, for example, Poles. As, as everybody knows here, the Poles feel somewhat justifiably that the one million Poles who were murdered by the Nazis have not received their recognition. So a, a trauma process unfolds. It can a, allow a sense of moral responsibility and um, re-representation of of victims, but it doesn't necessarily apply to all victims of an event, or not. The, I think that addresses your points. I'm not, can't remember them all, but what's the second one? The identity. The uh, identity crisis and oh, yeah. its outcomes regarding the uh, trauma. I mean, the way I see this, I don't, th I think that there is a psychological level to all of this, of course. And for, for example, the Germans who participated uh, in Nazi Germany, very few of them could psychologically disengage from the collective identity that, that they shared as a, as a nation. Um, that's why, as people have talked about the third generation, you need several generations to allow that to happen. On the other hand, um, for many Christians outside of Germany, there was, inside of the same generation, a re-representation of Jews and a, a turning a transformation in the identity of Jews. Um, I don't think it's a matter of psychology, though. There's also a collective identity here. I think that when in the post World War II period, post World War I period, when so many Germans became convinced that the Jews were the reasons for the trauma of Weimar. Germany, this became a narrative that they were deeply committed to and they experienced it for two decades and I don't think it was, was very difficult for people to give that up. Other questions or comments? 
Herr Wiktor. Um, yes, one, one question. I'm not quite sure how literally to take this term of trauma in the case of societies, because in the original psychological um, meaning, we talk about an overwhelming shock that literally destroys all ordinary psychological defenses. So I'm not quite sure, for example, in the case of the American society, um, would you claim that they are being the object of such a collective trauma in, in, in this sense, or is this something much more metaphorical, more in the, in the sense of the, theat of the metaphors of the theater you're using, um, as an audience to something that uh, they may choose to watch, but they also may choose to not to watch? And if this is the case, why even, I mean, why insist on, the, on this idea of, of trauma in this case, if it's so different from the individual psychology? Well, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't insist on it myself. Society has, has used it that way. I mean, starting in the 60s, uh, the trauma has become a lay term, not just a psychological term. And it's been used to say we, for example, Western society was traumatized by the Holocaust or Germany was traumatized, or the revelations of the death camps did this, or what we've learned about slavery has traumatized all white Americans. This is a language that has been used. So we can say, well, it was started in 19th century psychology, or actually it was started in, in, met, in biology, then it moved to psychology, and then it moved over the last 30 years to society. So yes, it's, it's not the same, but, and you say it's metaphorical, but to me, social life is built on metaphors. It's not, a metaphor is very powerful, it's a very significant, and it, it has material effects. Still, we do have time to, to discuss the theoretical level of the presentation. <laughs> Alexander Korb. Um, thank you for your lecture. My question goes in a similar direction as the first uh, question, as uh, Mr. Kapralski's question. Um, I'm wondering to what extent actually uh, the global implications of the Holocaust and the ways the concept uh, Holocaust influenced a global perception of, of processes of mass violence does actually not sometimes block uh, processes, trauma processes as you have described them. Um, and I'm thinking of the way the Holocaust or the concept of the Holocaust is influencing uh, this field of genocide studies, which often actually leads to, to well, um, competition of, of victimhood and to um, attempts to be recognized as kind of first class victims. And of course, the ultimate victimhood is um, having suffered from a genocide. So I can think of so many examples where. Um, this concept of, of genocide actually increases tensions between groups, leads to mutual genocide allegations, and at the end of the day also ethnicizes the whole pro process because in uh, civil war-like situations, uh, it's not, oft not so often a conflict between ethnicities, between, but between a multitude of groups, and the framework of genocide, I think, often actually, well, makes, makes it into two groups, very often ethno-religious. So the question really is, uh, to what extent in, does this, and does a scientific conf concept such as the concept of genocide studies uh, has an impact on, on trauma, on the concept of trauma? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I know this critique, of course. Um, I have the exact opposite view, and that's the one I develop in my work. I, I see that the competition for 
as you call it, competition for victim status as positive. Because when that means that when somebody occupies victim status, they can be confident of having um, a solidarity with large groups of citizen audiences. They, because a narrative exists, they can be confident of, um, of moral acceptance. Why, why are Roma competing? Why are Roma so active in identifying themselves as having a Holocaust? What, what is this about? Because the Roma are so denigrated and so marginalized, why are they reach? They have no material power. They're reaching for a moral status. The Holocaust trauma isn't blocking them. The Jews haven't prevented this. The Holocaust narrative is allowing a, a despised and powerless group to gain moral authority by re-representing itself instead of being gypsies as having been victims of genocide. To me, this is positive. What I'm trying to describe in my work is how a, a, structure, a narrative structure has emerged that enlarges, that allows an enlarged moral capacity of Western societies. Yes, there is a competition for the status because to occupy it, uh, you acquire, when you occupy it, you have symbolic and moral authority. This, is not this isn't something that just started now, of course. I mean, the whole idea of Jesus Christ is the same kind of thing, isn't it? Unjust suffering. But this is an enlargement of a moral category. And in my analysis, as I've tried to talk about in terms of the anti-imperialist movement, the anti-racism movement, the movement to make vivid the role of Aboriginal or First Peoples, the Holocaust has played a very, very powerful role. The whole idea of of human rights and of genocide is something immensely positive in my opinion. The, I, and I don't think that it ethnicizes or racializes. You don't, you had the ethnic and racialization of conflict long before 1945 or 1960. This is something that was always done. The question is what kind of cultural resources exist to condemn that as abnormal and deviant and to mobilize world opinion. When something gets constructed as a genocide, it has tremendous consequences. It, nothing could get categorized as a genocide before the 1960s. That understanding, that classification, it didn't exist in human history. It was thought to be, okay, this happens. You can't do anything about it. I'm trying to explain how a new category of moral understanding developed, which I'm not saying is perfect, to the contrary. It's very, very unevenly applied, as I tried to show in the last part of the lecture. Um, just a comment for the last comment that, um, well, the the Holocaust is now an example for everyone. It's Anna Frank example. It means that we all have something to learn from example of one group. So the trauma is using not as an example of one group or another, but something global. And I think that the idea of trauma is getting from one group to other standards that we all can use. So the, the, the term Holocaust now used in very different meanings to different uh, 
actions and events. And uh, also, I would like to hear um, what do you think about the political use of, uh, of the Holocaust? Because of course, that the discussion in the United States starts only in the 70s, uh, when they have something to, to emphasize also, also because of uh, political power of, of Jewish that lives in the United, United States, but also to emphasize uh, democracy, the, the values of the United States, not only people without means, like the Roma peoples, but of course, political institution like the United States or others use the Holocaust in order to maybe expand or m more val values of one idea or another. In this case, it's democracy, but in other cases, it's other values. So I would like to hear what is your opinion. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And I'm, I like, of course, the first comment you made. I mean, my argument is that the Holocaust became, even as the term Holocaust came into being, because it only came into being in terms of this uh, crime in the, after 1960, um, it, the Holocaust became a generalized moral um, crime uh, or symbol. It, it, the U.S., in the first 20 years after the war, the United States, Britain, and France owned the Holocaust in the sense that it allowed them to criticize Nazism, of course, and anti-Semitism, but also made them seem pure, because they were the ones who had liberated the camps. Um, in the same way uh, that Israel, for example, used the Holocaust, although it wasn't very important. It wasn't, it wasn't, the Holocaust wasn't central to Western identity after World War II, not for 20 years, but it was a story that was told as part of the victory over Nazism. And what happened over a, a long period of time after 1960 was that the Holocaust became separated from the Nazi conflict. So that if you ask American school children what was World War II about, they say it was about the Holocaust. That's what I mean by dehistoricization. It's not these school children know nothing about World War II. They don't know much about Nazism. So there's a whole different understanding of what happened. Um, my own view, I, which is counterintuitive, is that the US in the 60s and early 70s lost its hegemonic role in the telling of the Holocaust story so that the U.S., as I tried to suggest, became subject to withering criticism by groups who were opposed to its interests, who evoked the Holocaust narrative of genocide and perpetrator against the American military and the American government. I believe that that was quite influential and powerful and isolated the United States and basically stopped that war. Um, I think that, for example, the same process has happened in Israel and in Palestine, that the Palestinians have developed their own parallel notion of Holocaust the Nakba, which is what happened to them when Israel was founded, and now there's an annual celebration of that event, a memorial event inside of Palestinian society, which is in competition with the Holocaust. Um, so I agree with you that the US used this memory for its own benefit, but I think that that's only, that 
really only lasted until the 70s, and that since then, the U.S. has been um, itself subject to all sorts of criticisms for committing holocausts. Of course, it not literally Holocaust, but figuratively Holocaust. And um, I think that represents an enlargement of the moral universe and is a very important political and moral event. Don't you think that the use of the, of the term Holocaust is used for a political, to stress political points for example, the Nakba, or for example, um, the the Roma. When you mention it's it's in order to, in they of course each one could uh, talk about his own events, his own catastrophe. But using this term, it's not only um, globalization of uh, of trauma or moral universal moral, but to emphasize some kind of a political demand. Which, which is getting stronger when you use the term Holocaust. Of course. I mean, people use whatever they can when, when they want to get things. But is that, is the, can we explain the um, creation of the Holocaust drama for political reasons? No. I don't think so. To me, the creation of this narrative is about myth and legend and, uh, and human suffering. It, it's become the core myth of suffering, really, um, in a lot of the world, although not the whole world. So it has not penetrated Asia, most Asian societies. They don't have the language of the Holocaust. Um, so yeah, it's used. It's certainly used politically, but it's not invented. Uh, and and also when I think when Roma people use it, or African Americans, or Aboriginal people, they use it also for moral and emotional reasons. They see themselves in this way, and it makes allows them to make sense of the world and um, allows them to try to find um, solidarity with people who are not in their group. So, form of communication. Question? So, thank you very much for the very, very interesting discussion. Um, happy to <coughs> have this um, experience, it's not unclaimed experience, but the experience which I learned from the book itself. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the, for the very good questions and comments. And uh, 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 I, I will turn in German. Uh, our, uh, unsere nächste Veranstaltung uh, wird am 4. April uh, stattfinden. Uh, das ist die lange Nacht der Forschung. Und uh, das Wiener Wiesenthal-Institut uh, uh, wird eine lange Nacht im Depot verbringen. Und Sie sind herzlich uh, einladen. <lacht>